These are good verses. All right, let's go ahead and uh, read Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 5. Proverbs 30, verse number 5. The Lord says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Let me read it again. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Every word of God is pure. That means every one of them. Every single one of them. They're pure words. You know the purest thing on the face of this earth is that Bible? Do you realize that's the only physical thing you have of God in this world is that Bible? Every word of God is pure. Every word. Uh, and then he says this. He said, He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Uh, the Lord fights for His people. The Lord stands for His people. And He does it. One way He does it is through the Word of God. Now the Bible is a worldwide book. Everybody knows about the Bible. It's known throughout the world as the Christian's book. Not only is it known throughout the world, but it's looked at in different ways, and some regard it as the words and revelations of God uh, to a, a dying world. Some don't regard the Bible at all, and some downright hate the Bible and love to get, the, get rid of it and get rid of its influence, but they'll never do it. Regardless of how you feel about the Bible, what you find is that everybody quotes the Bible. Hollywood quotes the Bible all the time. Hollywood quotes the Bible all the time. I've got a set of books up there called The Northwoods Reader, written by an agnostic, and he's from the uh, Upper Peninsula there in, in uh, Michigan. And he was born and raised there. He was born in 1905, and he was raised there and uh, spent most of his adult life there. And he's an agnostic. His daddy was an atheist, and he's an agnostic. He said, I doubt my doubts, uh, you know, some of these guys say that kind of stuff to hopefully if there is a God that he'll understand. Well, that's not the way it is. You either believe God or you don't. Amen. You either believe he's there or he's not. Amen. And that's the way the Lord does things. And uh, it's a matter of faith. You'll either put your faith and trust in him or you won't. And that's just all there is to it. But anyway, this guy up there, his name is Cully Gage. And um, he writes these books up there. And they're, they're very interesting. And I love to read them. But every now and again, he'll quote a verse. He'll quote a verse. And he doesn't believe the verse, but he'll quote the verse. Every now and again, he'll talk about a hymn. Uh, every now and again, he'll talk about God. But what he does, he quotes Scripture throughout the whole thing. And that's interesting to me. If you're an agnostic or if you're an atheist, what in the world are you doing quoting Scripture? Why are you doing that? Because you're really not an agnostic and you're really not an atheist. The problem is you're just not man enough or woman enough to stand up and say that you believe in God. Yeah. Everyone loves to quote the 23rd Psalm, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The liberals, they lo love to quote uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And uh, they, they, they love to quote that because it makes them feel good about themselves, you know. Blessed are the poor, blessed is this, blessed is that, and so on and so forth. Most people love the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they reject the verses about the, the crucifixion of Christ. And the reason for that is they just don't like to talk about death. They call it a bloody book, a bloody salvation. They want to keep the Lord as a babe in the manger instead of the crucified Son of God on the cross and the risen Savior of the world uh, that's where they want to keep him. They want to keep him as a babe in a manger. Oh, they can handle that. But they can't handle why he came, what he came for, what he did, and what he's going to do. They can't handle that. Uh, there are many verses in the Bible that people will not heed, and they don't want to hear. And because they don't want to hear them, and they don't want to listen to them, and they don't want to adhere to them, uh, preachers don't preach on them. Very few preachers now today preach on the subject of hell. Now, I don't like preaching on hell. I really don't. I, and the older I get, the less I like it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ preached seven times on hell. That's more than any other one subject in all the Word of God that He preached on. He preached seven times on hell. Isn't that something? 
But preachers don't want to preach on hell today. You know why they don't want to preach on hell? Because people don't want to hear it. You know what they're preaching on today? Oh, how, how to cope with life, how to get along in this world, and how to feel good about yourself, and all this stuff. Well, that's not the words of God. There, there are many of these verses in the Bible, and they're just as important as other verses in the Bible, but men don't want to hear them. They don't want to hear them. Except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish, Jesus Christ said. People don't want to hear that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. They don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it. Uh, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, being in hell. He don't, they, want to, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. But I'm going to give you this morning, Lord willing, four main verses that folks close their ears against. And you might say, well, why these four? Because they sum up man's deepest hatred and his deepest fears. These four verses do. I'm not talking about just the unbelievers. I'm talking about a lot of Christians are afraid of these four verses. And these verses are not about what you might think. But they have some very interesting similarities. All four are the basic doctrinal truths which every Christian should be sounding out. And all four are outright rejected by the world and have never been accepted in part or in whole. And number three, all four are known, but because of a desire to be accepted in the world or at least not rejected by the world, they are avoided. That's what the thing is. Most people, it's not so much that they're afraid of, of uh, uh, not being accepted by the world. They don't want to be rejected by the world. You see what I'm telling you? They don't want to be a total outcast by the world. The best thing you can do is be an outcast by the world. If the world doesn't want you around, you're doing something right. If the world doesn't like the way you preach, then you're preaching something right. If the world doesn't like the Bible it used, that you use, you're doing something right. You're doing something right. If you want to see how man feels about himself and about the Lord Jesus Christ and about the Bible, then get his reaction to these four verses that I'm going to give you. All right? First of all, look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. These verses will tell you the character of a man. They'll tell you what he thinks about God. They'll tell you what he thinks about God's Son. They'll tell you what he thinks about the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse 27. The Bible said, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Very simple little verse. Tucked away back there, way back in, in a book that uh, a lot of people don't read, don't understand, and don't take seriously. But way back there in the book of Hebrews in chapter 9, all the way down there in verse 27, you find the Lord saying that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after they die, they've got to go to judgment. That thing is as true as anything you've ever heard. That thing is just as true as John 3.16. That thing is just as true as any, any verse in the Bible. The whole thing about the matter is this. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. There's, there's an exception to the rule, but ex the exception proves the rule. The exception is the rapture might take place, and if the rapture takes place, some of us aren't going to die. I hope he comes today, as Brother Derek was saying. I hope, I hope he comes today. I hope he comes within the next few minutes. I really do. Amen. But if he doesn't, all of us are going to fill hospital beds and graveyards. That's just all there is to it. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after you die, guess what? There's a judgment. There's a judgment. Now, if you're a Christian, you've been judged at Calvary. You've been judged as a sinner. And now God looks at you and finds you not guilty. He's justified you on the basis of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, on His death, burial, and resurrection. If you're a Christian, you've been judged at Calvary. You've already had that kind of a judgment, but there's still a judgment to come. You've still got to go to heaven and be judged at the judgment seat of Christ for what kind of Christian life you've lived since you've been saved. It doesn't determine whether you go to heaven or hell. You decided that when you trusted Christ as your Savior. But your service for Jesus Christ is going to be judged one of these days. 
as it is appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. The world cannot stand the truth that there's going to be a judgment after death. The judgment where every man must give an account of his words, of his thoughts, of his actions to a holy and a righteous God. Now here's this unsaved man. He's walking down the road. He's got all the money he wants. He's got all the fame he wants. He's got everything he wants. He's got everything he wants. And then he goes out into eternity. He goes out into eternity and he dies without Jesus Christ. And he goes up and he stands before Jesus Christ, whom he rejected upon this earth. And the Lord says, let the books be opened. They open up the books. And the Bible says that everything that he said or thought will be brought into judgment. But you know what's going to send that man to hell? He rejected Jesus Christ. That's what's going to send a man to hell. Say, why do people go to hell today? Because they don't trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's why they go to hell. You say, but what about the murderers and the rapists and all these people? What about them? Aren't they going to hell because they're that way? They go to hell because they've rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. They do all those things because they're unsaved and lost. But they go to hell because they've rejected Jesus Christ. Could you imagine standing before a holy, righteous God that knows everything about you, knows what you're thinking and have thought your whole life? And you go stand before him to be judged, and you don't have Jesus Christ? Boy, what a mess. What a mess, man. What a mess. And the Lord looks at you and he says, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Off into hell they go. That's what's going to happen, folks. Sure as you live and breathe. There have been famous people uh, die in this world. And they've gone out to meet God, just leave this world just like that, and gone out to meet God just like that. You say, what's going on? They go to judgment. The great white throne judgment will judge every unsaved man, woman, boy, and girl. Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, the Bible says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set, and the books were opened. God's going to open this book. God's going to open this book, and He's going to judge mankind out of this book. The books were opened. You know what this is? This is a book of books. This is a book that has 66 books in it. What about that? And God's going to judge man out of these books. Except you believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. That's what Jesus Christ said. Matthew 12, verse 36 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak... They shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Every word. Luke 18, verse 17, he said, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither is anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Boy, that's rough stuff. Here you are, an unsaved man, and you think you're all right. You've been a pretty good fellow all your life. Uh, you did right. You had a lot of money. You lived in the lap of luxury, and you've done all these things, but... You've still been good to the poor. You gave to charities and you've done this and you've, you've been a good man and uh, you paid your taxes and you didn't cheat on your wife and you did all these good things and you live a good long life and then you die. What happens then? You go to judgment. You go to judgment. And if you don't have Jesus Christ, off into hell you go. Depart from me, I never knew you. Look at Psalm chapter 39. There's one thing for sure. You're going to die unless the Lord comes back. And once you die, you're going to judgment. Here's another verse. Psalm 39. Psalm 39 verse 5. Psalm 39 verse 5. The first verse we saw... We saw the judgment of man. The next verse we see, we're going to see the righteousness of man. Psalm 39, verse 5 said, Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. What about that? 
Right there's the verse you give to somebody that thinks he's a pretty good old boy. God says, you're altogether vanity. You're worthless. That's what vanity means, worthless. You're vain. You're worthless. Vanity. You're altogether vanity. Our life, he said, is like a hand breath. It's just not very long. No matter if you live 70, 80, 90 years, it's still not very long. And he says, he's made my days as a hand breath. He said, verily, every man in his best state is altogether vanity. After living 60, 70, 80, 90 years, you're still vanity. See, there's a problem between man and God. And the fact is, is the righteousness of man, the Bible says in Isaiah, he said it's as filthy rags. That's what God said over there. The problem with man is he's got no righteousness. Well, in the eyes of himself, in the eyes of his friends, and maybe in the eyes of the world, he may be a pretty good old boy. But if he doesn't have the righteousness of God, he's going to die in his sins. Because his righteousness is no good. That's a verse hated by the world. That's a verse that says to the world, the best you can do, the best you can do is unclean. The best you can do is unrighteousness. That's what the Word of God says about your goodness. I had a fellow say one time, he told one of the folks here in the church, he said, uh, well, if uh, doing right and working hard and raising a family doesn't get you to heaven, he said, then I don't guess I'll go. Well, you won't go. You won't go. I, mean, I don't want to see anybody go to hell. Do you? I don't want to see anybody go to hell. But they're going. They are going. Just as sure as they're going to heaven, there are people going to hell. I don't like that, but there it is. Without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the best deeds a man can do by following his heart will land him in an eternal lake of fire. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible said in Proverbs 12.4, He said, A high look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin." The Bible said to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The Bible said the thought of foolishness is sin. The Bible said there is none that doeth good and sinneth not. You can't get by it. The wages of sin is death. There's nobody in the last 6,000 years ever lived forever. Anybody here know anybody that's 6,000 years old? Anybody know anybody that's here that lived 200 years? They don't. You know why they don't? The wages of sin is death. So the righteousness of man at best is no good. Now look at John chapter 3. So we saw the first thing. We saw the judgment of man. The second thing we see is the righteousness of man. And the third thing we're going to see is the uncleanness of man's nature. Your very nature is corrupt. Your very nature John 3 and verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, folks, your first birth won't do. Your first birth just won't do. All men are born wrong the first time. And there's no religion in this world can, that can make him acceptable in God's sight. Did you hear me what I said? No religion in this world can make you acceptable in the sight of God apart from Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22, the Bible says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam brought forth death, and you're the children of Adam. The first birth, this fleshly birth, that's, that's, you're children of Adam. And inside that body that you've got is a nature that is defiled and ungodly and sinful. What you need is a new birth. You need a spiritual birth. You was born physically. You were born physically. Now you need to be born again spiritually on the inside. Because this first birth is no good. So you must be born again. That's why Jesus Christ said what he said. He didn't say it's a good idea to be born again. He didn't say maybe you ought to be born again. He said you must be born again. Yeah. You've got to have that second nature because your first nature is no good. 
Your first nature is against God. It's against the Bible. It's against Jesus Christ. You've got to have a new nature. We talked about in Sunday school this morning. 1 Peter 1 verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Being born again. Jesus Christ, except the man said, except the man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's two births. The first birth is a physical birth. Everybody gets this one or you wouldn't be here, right? The second birth, everybody don't get this one. Only those that trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. And those that trust Jesus Christ as their Savior are born again. And you have a spiritual nature now that wars against the flesh, that fights against the flesh. And if you don't have that war going on within you, then you need to check and see whether or not you're saved. Because God says the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And these two are contrary one to another that you cannot do the things that you would. You got a bad nature. You saw, oh, I thought I had a good turn nature. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about the real you. The real you is full of sin. The real you took on its father's nature. And that's Adam. He says, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You've got to have another nature. You must be born again. You must be born again. I want you to look at this last one with me. Acts chapter 1. We've seen the judgment of man. We've seen the righteousness of man. We've seen the uncleanness of man's nature. Now we're going to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about verses that people despise. That people hate. That people don't take seriously. The Lord is coming again. Acts chapter 1 verse 11 the angel sitting there as Jesus Christ rises up into heaven. And the Bible says, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall, so shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He goes up with the clouds, and guess what? He's coming back down with the clouds. But he's coming again. You believe that? You really believe that? I remember when I first got saved, I believed that so intensely. I believed it so much that every day I got up, I'd go outside and look out the window and see if there's any clouds in the air. I really would. I just knew that the Lord was coming back, and He was coming back so soon. And I still believe that He's coming. I still believe He's coming. Now, He may not come in my lifetime. I hope that He does. But He's coming whether He comes in my lifetime or whether He doesn't. Paul thought He would come in his lifetime. 2,000 years ago, the Lord is coming again. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same Lord Jesus who laid in His manger 2,000 years ago is coming literally and He's coming physically back to this earth. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is not a spiritual thing we're talking about. I'm talking about the man Jesus Christ, the Son of God that walked upon this earth that same Lord God Almighty, the Son of God, will be returning one of these days, and we're coming with Him. Yes, sir. Yeah. It'll be a great day. And when He comes back, you talk talking about things changing. Yes, things are going to change. You know, if the rapture were to take place in the next hour, two hours, the next week, do you realize how that our problems as Christians would go away? There's not a problem that you've got right now in your life as a Christian that wouldn't be gone if the rapture took place. It'd be solved. You see, the Lord is going to solve all of our problems, but for the unsaved in the world, He's going to create a lot of problems. You hear what I'm saying to you? The Lord is going to come back, and when He comes back, things are going to change. And let me tell you, that second coming is just as true as that first coming. Amen. He talked about it over there in Genesis chapter 3. He prophesied about his second coming along with his first coming. That's how sure it is. He's coming again. Are you ready to see him, Christian? Are you ready to see him? 
Do you want him to come? I know you hear the preacher say all the time, boy, I wish he'd come, I wish he'd come, I wish he'd come. But do you really want him to come? What if he were to come today? Would you be ashamed? What about the unsaved people? What would they do if the Lord came today? Well, their life would change. It would change drastically. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming literally and physically to the earth to set up a political, military dictatorship, and He's going to reign as sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords in Jerusalem. He's going to change the whole political system of all the world when he comes back. He's going to reign as the absolute king of all kings in Jerusalem. And everybody is going to have to submit themselves to his authority. Every nation under the earth is going to have to submit themselves to his authority. And if they won't, he cuts their water off. He stops the rain. It won't take that. It won't take long for a country to get right with God. And he cuts their rain off. Do you realize what would happen to this country, our country, our great, great country, this greatest country in all the world? Do you realize what would happen to us if it stopped raining in this country for one month? We couldn't survive. He's going to come back. He's going to reign as absolute king of kings and lord of lords. Military dictatorship. Because when he comes back, he's going to fight. He's not coming like he came the first time. When he comes back the second time, he's going to fight. And we're going to fight with him. The world is okay with Jesus Christ. As long as you keep him in the manger. As long as you keep him nailed to the tree. They're okay with him. But don't you bring him off that cross. Don't you take him out of that manger. Don't you let him come out of that grave. Because if he did those things, then he is who he said he was. He is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The holy, righteous Son of God. And all the world, all the world will someday look at him and stand before him and be judged. They'll stand before him and give an account of their life and they'll get, stand before him and give an account of their, their righteousness. And they'll stand before him and give an account of their unclean nature. And they'll stand before him also because he, he's coming again. I tell you, if you're not saved this morning, you need to get saved. You need to get saved because he might come today. Seriously. And if he does, where will you be? Will you be with him or you'll be left behind? Now, I gave you four verses this morning that the world would hate. They hate it, and a lot of Christians are scared to death of them. But these four verses will help you to understand some things about the Lord. Not only that, it will help you understand some things about yourself. Are you saved this morning? I hope that you are. If you're not, you need to get saved. What if he were to come today and you weren't saved? You'd be left behind. That'd be a bad thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessings.